Well, welcome to Los Angeles. I'm glad you could make it. Um, this seminar is based on the book that I published last year, Bollinger on Bollinger Bands. It includes quite a bit of material that's not in the book, but it roughly follows the outline of the book. That is, today on day one, we'll focus on the essentials, the basic building blocks of technical analysis, trading bands, and some of the indicators that you use to combine into trading systems. And tomorrow, we'll focus primarily on trading systems, rigorous set of rules to get you in and out of the market with a good measure of protection in the form of stops. One of the things I didn't discuss in the book was stops to any great degree. And we will see two examples of stops, a custom version of Wells Wilder's parabolic system, sometimes called stop and reverse. And the system that I've been using recently, which I found very powerful and very interesting, is chandelier stops. They were developed by uh, Chuck LeBeau. But that, we'll get, to the, we'll get to those tomorrow, although we'll see a couple of examples of them today. The core of my approach to the markets is something I call rational analysis. If you think about the two branches of, of stock market analysis that are out there, one is called fundamental and the other is called technical. Fundamental is really about the realities of the company and technical is about the realities of the marketplace. I firmly believe that if you combine those approaches, you get the best of all possible worlds. For example, uh, if you were to look through the toolkit of the fundamental analysis analyst, um, you would find a number of tools that might be useful in your investing. For instance, a measure of growth that you could apply to stocks or um, perhaps some type of risk, risk measure to tell you that a corporation was getting into trouble and that, that that stock might be a risky stock. If you were to look through the technical analysis toolkit, you would find similar tools. Tools that confirm that the stock was in an uptrend, tools that confirm that the stock was in a downtrend. By combining those approaches, you get the best of all possible worlds. Essentially, you're taking the finest tools from the, to te from the technical toolkit and the finest tools from the fundamental toolkit and combining them into one approach. And I call that approach rational analysis. The, my definition of rational analysis is very straightforward. It's the juncture of the sets of technical analysis and fundamental analysis. It's that sweet spot where the sets overlap right here in the middle. Now that for me leaves many technical tools out of the equation and it leaves many fundamental tools out of the equation. That's because I find that those tools don't have the type of reliability that is necessary to create a profitable and especially consistently profitable stock market approach. Now I'm trained in both aspects of this business. I have a CFA, means I'm a chartered financial analyst. That's the basic designation that fundamental analysts go for. And I have a CMT, means I'm a chartered market technician. That's the basic definition that market technicians go for. I started out as a fundamental anal analyst and I became a technical analyst. It was only after many years that I realized one didn't have to be one or the other. One could combine the approaches into a su successful approach, and that's when I started propounding the idea of rational analysis. Now, there's lots of people in the fundamental world who think that that's an idiotic idea, and there's lots of people in the technical world that think that's an idiotic idea. And that somehow tells me that I'm on the right track. <laughs> you know, it's like a... Um, if we, it's, it's like when we look to our political leaders. You know, if they're pleasing everybody, they're probably doing the wrong thing. But if they're making everybody equally uncomfortable, it probably means they're more or less on the right track because they're rocking everybody's boats to a certain degree in the pursuit of their goal. 
And I think that that's what rational analysis is. It's the combination of two great disciplines. Now, why do we need to combine the two disciplines? Because frankly, the fundamental data set is a large and rich data set, and the technical data set is a much smaller, much tighter data set. So by reaching out from the technical world and into the fundamental world, we can expand our data set and improve the robustness of our approach to the market. If you think about it, the technical data set is really very small data set indeed. For any given period, you have the opening price, the high price that was recorded during that period, the low price that was recorded during that period, the closing price of that period, and the volume or the number of transactions that were um, recorded during that period. And I say volume or number of transactions um, because often in the futures market you don't get an accurate report of volume. You simply get the number of transactions, the number of trades that have been uh, reported. That's sometimes called tick volume. It's useful, but it's quite a different quantity than volume in the stock market, which is the actual volume of all the transactions, the number of shares that have been transacted. For instance, in the futures market, you might have a tick volume of 1,000, but that might mean that you know, some 10,000 contracts had been traded because they were traded in that those 1,000 trades represented trades of 10 lots of futures contracts each. And you only get the volume really the next day, and then it's not all that reliable. So it's two different quantities. Beyond this, we don't really have much more in the way of technical data items. We may have a sentiment measure, such as uh, um, a put-call ratio, the comparison of the amount of options that are traded with, by people who are betting on higher prices to, to the number of options that are traded by people betting on lower prices. Or we might have a sentiment survey um, where somebody goes out and says, are you bullish on the market or are you bearish on the market? Um, a number of firms conduct such surveys and publish them. So there may be a few other ancillary pieces of data, but when we get right down to it, this is the core of the technical data set. And everything that we do is based on operating on that data set. Therein lies one of the great perils of technical analysis. It's really easy to double count. It's really easy to derive the same fact from the data set in three or four different ways. And because we've derived that fact in three or four different ways, to believe that it's three or four different facts, well, that's not the case. Um, for instance, um, momentum indicators. Several people will, will um, put up a chart and underneath it they'll plot three or four different types of momentum indicators and when they all confirm they, they have a, a, a great feeling of security that they're really on the right track, but th those four momentum indicators are really all saying the same thing. So it's not true confirmation. And later on we'll explore some of the indicators you can use such as volume indicators, momentum indicators, to diversify your indicator set so that when you get confirmation it is in fact genuine confirmation, confirmation that you can rely on, confirmation that can improve your confidence in making the trade. If you think about it for a minute, there are really only two ways to improve your trading process. You can either improve the number of trades that you make that are winners versus the number of trades you make that are losers. Say you're making six winning trades for every four losing trades. You can try to push that to seven winning trades for every three losing trades. That's one dimension that you can improve your performance in. The other dimension is the size of the winning trades versus the size of the losing trades. Say on average you're losing two and a half, three, four points on your losers and making eight or nine points on your winners. You can try to increase that tilt so that your winners are marginally increased over the dollar value of your losers. 
by examining both of those approaches and pushing them just a little bit, you'll see that you can get a tremendous improvement in your overall performance. For instance, just to give an example, a lot of systems, a lot of really reasonable trading systems have performance rates that are really close to 50-50. They throw out about half winners and half losers. Well, how could you trade such a system? I mean, over time, you'd be flat, wouldn't you? Not if the winners were twice the size of the losers. So by combining these approaches, if we get, say, into a 60% winning ratio, so we have six winners for every 10 trades, and we get up to, say, our winners are one and a half times the size of our losers, all of a sudden we have a truly good trading system that's going to make money consistently over time. A lot of people look at trading systems and the first thing they do is they count up the number of trades that won versus the number of trades lost. And if that's not some terrific number like 90%, they walk away from the trading system and don't bother to look at it anymore. They're searching for that holy grail. That's a mistake. And some people want their losers to be incredibly small. So the first thing they do is they look at not the number of losers, but the average size of the losers. And if that's beyond a certain size, then they get rid of the trading system. That too can be a mistake because if that system where you had, say, losers on average of four points, but the winners were on average were nine or ten points, that's a great system especially if it's consistent over time. So those are the di dimensions that we're going to look at during the course of this seminar, trying to improve both the relative size of our winners versus losers. That's going to be largely a function of the kinds of stops we use and the kinds of ex exit rules that we use. And we're going to look at improving the number of winning trades versus the number of losing trades. And that's really going to be a function of the systems that we deploy, the decision-making systems, buy here, sell there. Don't get caught in this thing of trying to get the holy grail, trying to get both of those numbers really up to giant high values, the ratio of winners to losers and the percentage of winners, because you don't have to get there to be very, very successful. In fact, I think that if you develop systems that are pinned way up at those very high values, those systems will probably prove to be rather fragile. And they'll start breaking after a while and really leave you bereft. So I want you to kind of keep those two ideas in mind because they're going to be the main avenues of our exploration. The first thing we're going to start to do is look at how to plot our data. Um, this is the simplest chart that you can possibly have. And it's the chart that is most commonly seen. And that's a shame because it skips, doesn't present a great deal of the data set. In this case, this is a line that is drawn connecting the closes. Uh, so there's no reference to the open, no reference to the high, no reference to the low, and no reference to volume, which is a very important part of the puzzle for us. So when you, when you turn on CNBC or when you go to Big Charts or when you go to any of these places on the web, this is the chart that you most likely see. When you see this chart, I would ask that you ask for more. You know, this is a very poor depiction that is hiding a tremendous amount of the information. So if the default chart you're presented is this type of chart, Somewhere on that page will most likely be an option to present a more robust chart, and you should go for that. So what we've done here is draw the classic chart of technical analysis. Each bar represents one period of trading. It's a line drawn from the high of the period to the low of the period. There's a tick to the left 
for the opening price and a tick to the right for the closing price. This type of chart has been used in this country for perhaps 80 or more years. Um, it is the most common technical analysis chart and it frankly it's a pretty good chart. What it doesn't do though is really draw your eye in a useful way to the relationships of the data. For that we have to go to an older chart type, the Japanese candlestick chart. Here we have exactly the same data deployed, but we have drawn a box on each bar that connects the open and the close of that bar. And that box is hollow or white when the open was lower than the close. So if we opened at 22 and closed at 24, that box will range from 22 to 24 and it will be hollow or white inside the box. Um, if we, on the other hand, opened at 27 and closed at 25, then that box will range from 27 to 25 on the chart, but it'd be filled in black. And it really draws the eye to that important dimension. Now, the Japanese strongly believe that the relationship of the open and the close is extremely important. It represents the strength during the day. They're not so much interested in whether we were able to open the stock higher or lower from the prior day as whether that strength was sustainable during the trading day. They regard a stock that opens up strongly and then trades lower during the day as a weak stock, even if it has a positive price change on the day. And I think that's a very important piece of the puzzle that Western analysts don't typically have access to. However, these days almost all of the charting software will allow you to look at these type of charts, these candlestick charts. Now there's one more dimension um, to these charts, and that's the lines drawn above and below the box. The Japanese call those lines whiskers, um, and it's an allusion to a cat who uh, um, has whiskers and knows, uh, uses them to size up its space, to understand its relationship to the objects around them. And uh, the whiskers are drawn from the bottom of the box to the low if the low was lower than than the box and drawn from the top of the box to the high if the high was outside of the box. So to go back to our example, if we opened at 22 and traded up to 25 and then closed at 24, there'll be a one point long whisker above the box from the close, white box it's going to be, to the high of the day. And suppose this was the situation. We opened at 22, traded to 25, sold off down to 21, and then rallied back to 24. We'd have our same box running from 22 to 24. It would be white because we closed higher than we opened. And it would now have a one-point whisker on the bottom and a one-point whisker on the top. So that's a Japanese candlestick. And it really informs the eye in a way that a Western chart simply doesn't. And I strongly urge you to use candlestick charts if you have access to them. You know, I have this thing, I'm never willing to leave anything alone. You know, well enough alone is simply not part of my vocabulary. So I said, well, candlesticks are nice. They work well, but it, it's kind of odd, the box and the whiskers. And, and, and I like color coding. I like, I like to see, you know, I like to see colors. The traditional Japanese candlesticks are actually red and white. If, the, if we close lower on the day, then the whole candlestick, whiskers and all, is drawn in red uh, and filled in in red. And if it's clo we close higher on the day, then the whole candlestick is drawn in white I mean, in red, and filled in in white. 
And I think that's very counterintuitive to the Westerner who regards red as stop or negative. The Japanese regard red as a very positive um, characteristic. So th th there's kind of a cultural mismatch. So I tried to rework this idea and, and I created these bars called Bollinger Bars. And the, the center of the bar um, here is um, green if the close was higher than the open and the center of the bar is red if the close is lower than the open. The whiskers are always filled in in blue. So in, in this first example, this would be our example of we opened at 22, um, rallied to 25, sold off down to 21, and closed at 24. Two one-point whiskers and a two-point body that's filled in in green. Green for go, for positive, for strong energy. The exact opposite would be the case in the next bar. We opened at 24, rallied up to 25, sold off to 21, and then closed at 22. So we, have, we closed lower than the open, and we have a situation where the center of the bar is now red, and we have the two one-point whiskers. You'd get a solid green bar if you opened at the very low of the day and closed at the very high of the day. So this would be opening at 21 and closing at 25. The Japanese would regard this as an incredibly positive bar even if the bar were below the previous bar. Right? They would still regard it as a very positive bar. And that's the key to this kind of candlestick idea. Even if the bar that we're looking at is below the previous bar, it can have positive characteristics. And even if the bar we're looking at is above the previous bar, it can have negative characteristics. The eye is drawn to this type of activity when you're using these types of bars. And these, you'll find these types of bars available on all of our sites slowly they are being integrated into the software. Um, Metastock has said that um, in the next release of Metastock they'll have these types of bars. So you'll see over the next couple of years you'll, you'll have wider and wider access to these bars. If you don't, by all means, use the traditional candlesticks. It's a vast improvement over the simple Western bars. And here's a, a chart of what this looks like for um, Freddie Mac. It's the same chart that we saw before with the Western bars, except now we have Bollinger bars. And I have, I have coded two different pieces of information here. The bars themselves tell you about the intraday relationship, how we closed or opened in that relationship. The color of the volume bar underneath tells you whether you closed higher or lower than the prior day. So if we're down on the day, we get a red volume bar. And if we're up on the day, we get a green volume bar. And look how interesting this is. We're making a low here, and we get two big green volume bars telling us that we've shifted from a negative environment to a positive environment. Again, we. We get another positive day in here, reinforced by another big green volume bar and yet another one. Then when we get over here, make a peak in Freddie Mac, immediately you start to get large red volume bars. Start telling you that the momentum, the trend is changing. It's shifting from a very positive period in here to what is going to be a negative period or neutral period in here. It tells you about change in trend. You run large green volume bars, and then all of a sudden you get one, two, three large red volume bars in a row. And it gives you a hint about the dynamics of what's going on in this. In addition, you get three big red Bollinger bars to confirm that shift from a positive environment to a negative environment. So what we're doing is using color to encode as much of the information in our data set as is possible so that the eye can 
easily pick out the salient features of the chart. You know, we all have a fabulous pattern recognition engine, and it's not in our computers, it's here. And by educating the chart so that it displays the information in the maximum in, in, in maximum utility, it allows our pattern recognition engine to, at a glance, tell us what's going on with this given security. I'm sorry, there was a question here? Just the, red, the red volume bar was when the, uh, open, the close was lower than the open? Correct. Yeah. The question is about the color coding of the bars. The, the volume bars are coded green when today's close is higher than yesterday's close. Price close. Price close. And they're coded red when today's close is lower than yesterday's close. Now, th this type of color coding of volume bars is supported by a lot of software, as you correctly point out, um, and they have a number of different schemes um, to do it. Um, for instance, TradeStation has this function called paint bars um, that allow you to colorize bars according to your own thinking. Um, and so a lot of the software will let you go in there and tinker with the way things are colored, the way things are organized, the way things are presented so that you can create a chart that works with maximum utility for your set of risk and reward criteria and for what you're comfortable with. There are some other chart types and I have always been a major um, fan of this particular chart type. It's called the point and figure chart. And it's a very interesting exercise because it portrays price action with no reference whatsoever to time. It draws the eye purely to the price formation mechanism. This is, in fact, the same chart as we saw. Whoops. As we saw here, uh, I think there are 100 bars on this chart, huh? a daily chart. And then here's the point and figure chart, and it, it reduces the price action to something on the order of 20 bars. So very often when you're looking at a security and you're confused, you're not getting a clear picture, you're not, you don't really get an understanding of what's happening to it. Maybe the, there's some interesting patterns that are showing up. Maybe there's some conflicting information on it. These point and figure charts can often serve as tiebreakers because they force your eye to consider only the price action. I don't recommend that they be used in and of themselves, but I think that they're a good ancillary way to look at the price structure, especially when there's some lack of clarity in your primary chart. This is a, um, your bit, we're back to your basic price chart. And what we're going to talk now about is the scaling of the price chart. This is a linear scale. Each distance on the price chart is equal to a certain amount of points in the stock. And that, that, that value is the same whether we're here down at the bottom of the chart or whether we're here at the top of the chart. Well, a five-point gain on a $65 item is a somewhat different event than a five-point gain on a $40 item. It's a much bigger percentage increase off a $40 base than it is a $60 base. So shouldn't we have charts that show us the impact of the security on the value of our portfolio? And my answer is absolutely. And the way we do that is by employing what's called log scaling. And if you look at these two charts, you can see that the high and low remain exactly the same, but the relationship of the bars changes quite dramatically. The distance between 40 and 45 here is a much greater distance than it is between 65 and 70 up here. So a log scale chart 
correctly draws the eye to the impact of the security on your trading results. Now, there is one exception to this. If you're trading futures, you should use linear scaling because you put up the same amount of margin at 20 that you do at 40 and the price change of a point has exactly the same amount of economic significance at 20 as it does at 40. So if you're using futures, if you're trading futures, please use linear scaling on your charts. It's the correct way to look at them. If you're trading stocks where the economic difference of a point at 40 is different from the economic difference of a point at 70, then please use log scaling. It just, it, it's all the difference in the world. It draws the eye to the impact of price action on your trading results. For stocks, I think you should always use log charts, regardless of the price, for a $200 stock or for a $5 stock. It just, it, it, it's the economic significance that's correctly portrayed, and it doesn't have anything to do with the overall price level. Now, point and figure charts treat that relationship differently, and we'll talk about that later um, in, in the day. Point and figure charts change the value of the box based on where you are. So in a way, they are already logarithmically scaled. Um, for instance, uh, um, the value of a box down here will be smaller than the value of a box up here. There, there are rules that say um, between um, $5 and $20 you shall use a box of say half a point. And between $20 and $40 you'll use a box of $20 and $50, use a box of a point, and above $50 you use a, a point and a half or whatever. There are any number of rule sets out there. Um, and we've done a lot of work on that and created a, um, a system called Bollinger Boxes that we'll talk about later that smooths those bumps out so we don't change box size when we go from 19 to 20, but we change box sizes smoothly during the day. But that's a, I'm getting ahead of myself. So point and figure charts, when you look at them, already have this log scaling component. It's not exactly log scaling, but it goes a long way toward the value of log scaling. Yeah, Point and figure charts actually come, come back from the very early part of the century. They were called figure charts. And um, the traders on the floor would keep track of their trades by writing down the last figure of the price. And so they would actually create a point and figure chart, instead of using X's and O's like here, X's are for when prices are rising, O's are for when prices are falling, they would actually write in the numbers. So they wouldn't have any scale. They would write, you know, 7 and a half, 8, 8 and a half, 9, 9 and a half, 8 and a half, so on and so forth in, in descending and falling columns. That's the earliest um, type of charting activity that we see recorded <coughs> in this country are the so-called figure charts that were kept by traders on the floor, they kept them on the back of their, you know, the, the tickets that they, um, their ticket book. Um, so that's kind of the earliest derivation of it. Um, and I think they're quite effective um, in the futures markets. Now, we pretty well explored the dynamics of the price portion of the chart. Now we're adding another piece to the puzzle. We're adding a volume portion. So eat, underneath each bar, we're drawing a bar from the bottom of the chart upward that shows the amount of trade that is that occurred in that given period. And this is a good time to start, stop and talk about periodicity. Um, I'm going to talk during these uh, two days primarily about daily charts. It's the area that I work in the most. It's the area I'm most comfortable in. It's the, the, the thing that, you know, it's just my discipline. 
Um, but anything I say can be applied to any other time interval. Some people keep hourly charts. Some people keep daily charts. Some people keep weekly charts. They can be monthly charts, what have you. So anything I say is applicable to any time interval, um, whether that's a five-minute time interval or um, a week. It's the same basic principles. We're trying to get a picture of the underlying price formation mechanism. So if this were five-minute bars, then each bar would represent the activity of that five-minute period, um, and each price bar would represent the high-low open and close of that five-minute period. Again, most of my charts are going to be um, daily charts until we get to late tomorrow when we talk about day trading. But please, if you're a short-term trader, think hours or five minutes or half hours or ten minutes. If you're a longer term, an intermediate term player, think days and weeks and months. Um, but the concepts are applicable right across the scale regardless of the time deployed. So here we have um, some idea of the volume of trade volume of trade that occurred during this period. Um, spikes are obviously high volume. Uh, little lulls like this are obviously low volume. Now one of the key themes that I found very important is this concept of relativity. Um, it's very hard to judge things in the absolute. It's much easier to judge things in a relative sense. So. What we're going to do in every case, at every turn during this seminar, is we're going to try to seek relative solutions to understanding the, the value of the variables that we're looking at. Um, yes, the eye can tell you that this was a high volume bar and this was a low volume bar, but we need a rigorous way of trying to get there. And the way to do that is to gauge the height of the bar in relationship to an average. So we've drawn here a 50-day average on our price bars. Nothing else has changed. All we've done is draw that 50-day average. Now, by definition, volume bars that extend above the average are high volume, and by definition, volume bars beneath the average are low volume. So, for instance, in this consolidation period here, right, this was a low volume consolidation. During this entire period, we had relatively low volume. So that's typical of what we see during a price consolidation. You saw strong volume during the markup phase, many bars above the average, and then we enter a consolidation phase on low volume. That's almost the classic definition of a consolidation phase. It's, there was a tremendous amount of interest and in news generated during this period. And now it's a time to digest all that information, and to digest all that news. And that almost always happens on much lower volume. Then news starts to flow back in. We start Volume starts to pick up, and we get another phase of markup. So by adding this simple average, we're able to judge on a rigorous basis whether volume is high or volume is low. Don't you ever listen on the radio and they say, Dow Jones is up 22 points on very high volume. Well, how would they know? <laughs> I mean, do you think that they know you know, it's, it's 10.30 in the morning. Do you think that they know what the average volume for the first hour's worth of trading is over the past 10 days so that they can compare that number? No. They went and called some trader someplace, and he said, oh, yeah, there's a lot of volume today, and they reported on the radio just like that. What we're trying to do is get away from that idea, and in all, every point in our analysis here, bring in some benchmark so that we can say things are high or things are low. And that's going to be the key to everything that we do for the, our entire two days here, is these relative measures of 
value, whether it's the value of a variable, whether it's the, the, the price of a stock, whether it's the level of an indicator. It's all anchored in relative measures. Now, we can go one step further. It's a little bit hard here to say that price is above the moving average. Well, if I look at this bar right here, it looks like price is about double the moving average. And if I look at this bar right here, it looks like price is about half of average. Well, we can solve that. We can do that just by dividing the volume by the average. We can take a ratio of each day's volume to the average. In essence, what we're going to do is we're going to grab this line by its first and last points and we're going to pull it straight. We're just going to iron it out. And this is what happens. Now we have divided the average so that relative volume is 100, it's average volume. Relative volume is 200, it's two times average. Relative volume is 50, it's half of average. So now we have a rigorous quantity. And what have we done? What bit of information, what bit of utility have we added here? We've added comparability. We can now compare it to other items. We can say on today, biotech stocks had a surge in volume that was roughly equal to twice the average, whereas steel stocks traded about half their average volume. So we can start comparing not only one stock to another, but we can compare all different kinds of things because we've made this a relative value measure. Is that a simple moving average? This is a simple moving average, a 50-day simple moving average. And here is the, um, here's the formula. Well, I call this normalized volume. Um, and it's today's volume divided by a 50-day simple moving average. And I multiply it by 100 just to bring it up to an integer scale. So we're not talking about 0.534 or something like that. It's, it's an easier number for the mind to get a handle on. So normalized volume, simply today's volume divided by the 50-day simple moving average of volume. And this is one of the first places that we can talk about tweaks. Um, you may be a shorter-term trader, and you may be more sensitive to changes in volume and more sensitive to what's going on and want to be working on a smaller number of bars, trying to capture just two or three or four bars worth of action, whereas somebody else may be looking to capture eight or 10 or 20 or 40 bars worth of action. Well, that person that's looking for the, to capture the larger number of bars is going to use a longer moving average, like a 50 period moving average. The person that's scalping, that, that, that's focused on capturing two or three or four bars worth of action, they may well want to shorten this average up and maybe make it a 10 period average or a 20 period average so it focuses more on the local action that's happening right there. I myself am an intermediate term investor. I'm trying to capture intermediate term moves, moves that span months. So this 50 day average works very well for our purposes. But you may well want to adapt this average in to more suit your trading style. And that brings me to a very, very important point. I'm going to present a lot of rules today and a lot of systems, a lot of numbers, a lot of variables and such. There's nothing holy about any of them. They're what I've found in practice works for me and I've tested them over time and, and they're my values. Um, all of them may be tweaked. All of them may be adjusted to suit your trading style and your risk and reward parameters. And please do so. You know, find out what works best for you. When I was taught this approach, I was taught it with a 50-day moving average. 
And I learned how to look at it that way. I've learned how to think about it that way over the years. So that's the way I do it. But there's nothing, there's nothing sacred about the 50-day average. Almost any software will allow you to do this. The generic, um, there are two different ways that it can be done. Um, you can either just drag a moving average and drop it on the, onto, the, um, onto, the volumes, um, onto the volume clip, which is how you would do it, say, in Metastock. Or you can create a custom indicator, and that indicator would be the, um, that formula that I gave you, volume divided by the 50-day moving average. Um, for instance, um, there we go. Look at that. Isn't technology wonderful? Um, in, I, I use a shorthand um, development language, and I'll, I'll show it to you, but it can be translated to any of your uh, software. So you would say volume divided by, and then I, I call that my moving average function, right? then a volume and 50 periods times 100. So that would be the shorthand. Now, each piece of software is going to you know, have a slightly different syntax. Like a Metastock, where after the 50, you put another comma and you put an S um, for simple or an E for exponential or some other software. Instead of using MOV, you'll use AVG or maybe EXP for an exponential moving average. But that's the generic way you would go about um, you would go about creating that indicator. So you can either just drag an, a moving average down and drop it on there, or you can create a little indicator like this um, and then plot that indicator instead of volume. Um, I, I personally do it this way, and that's how that chart that you saw was created. No, the normal rules of operation, um, volume, divided by the moving average, then times 100. I'll always do that. I'll, I'll always do the normal rules of operation. I'll never get fancy. If there's any fanciness, I'll put parens in for you so that you know what the correct order of operations is. I'll never, you'll never have any, um, all the formulas are presented throughout the handouts and everything in the normal order of operations. Just, you know, go from left to right and if there are parens, do the things inside the parens first, and then go from left to right. Are your averages um, typically your cool? Yeah. <laughs> the uh, moving averages are they typically simple moving averages? I use simple moving averages um, for almost everything, um, with the exception of some indicators. I use front weighted moving averages, and I'll be very clear. If, um, if I've deviated from the idea of using simple moving averages. One of the reasons is, is that I do a lot of volatility calculations, and inside the volatility calculation is a simple moving average. So it seems to me logically consistent to use simple moving averages for other things. But there are some places to deviate from that. But whenever I talk about an average, it's a simple moving average unless I say differently. Now. So we have our basic framework here. We have a, a price chart. We're using either Bollinger bars or candlesticks. We have a log scale if we're on stocks, a linear scale if we're on futures. We'll have normalized volume plotted beneath it. Even in the futures market, we have normalized volume plotted beneath it, even with a reporting delay. Because even though it comes a day or two late, it's still useful information. And you can, see, you, you can see the patterns change over time. And that will be one of the things, when we look into indicators, you'll see the pattern of the indicator change over time. So even if that data is delayed, as it is in the futures market, don't ignore it. It's still valuable data. So 
a little bit about nomenclature. Bollinger bands. I call them bands because they are, they are reflected around some measure of central tendency. And that's true for any type of trading <coughs> bands. Channels are straight lines drawn above and below the price structure. Usually, they are either fitted to some key points on the price structure, like a couple of important lows or a couple of important highs, but they are straight lines that form a channel of uniform width on the generally uniform width. It doesn't absolutely have to be. Envelopes, on the other hand, are like bands, but there's no reference to that central measure. So envelopes might be drawn some interval around the highs and some interval around the lows, or they might have some other type of structure, but they don't reference a single central point. So we have three kinds of items. Channels, linear channels drawn above and below the price structure. One of the wonderful things, um, i give you a little trick that a, a trader I know uses who uses channels all the time that I think is just terrific. When he has a price chart, and I'll just draw the simplest possible price chart here, almost everybody that you'll ever meet would take this and they would draw a trend line like so. And then they would take that trend line and shift it up to form the channel. And that would be their, their channel. Something like that. A trader I know does it a little bit differently. He takes, in an uptrend, he takes and draws the upper line first and then finds a key low and draws the lower line beneath it. Hmm? Parallel. What he's saying is he's not interested in the pullbacks so much. He's interested in the progress that the trend is making. So his basic measure is the rate of ascent. And then he's drawing an interval beneath it to identify the lower portion of the channel. Almost everybody works exactly the opposite. They start by connecting a couple of lows and then drawing in the trend line. I've tried both methods and I have to tell you in an uptrend drawing the upper line first and then reflecting it down to create the channel is the way to go. It gives the best description of the price mechanism. Likewise, in a downtrend, you draw the lower channel first and then fit the upper channel to a key high, and that forms your channel. So I think that that's a really um, um, neat trick. So just to recap real quickly, channels, straight lines drawn around the price structure, bands, intervals drawn around the price structure, but referencing some central measure. In my case, it's going to be a moving average. Um, then envelopes, again, lines drawn around the price structure, curves drawn around the price structure, but no central reference. Now, why, why trading bands? Right. Remember our idea with volume? By using um, a moving average on volume, we can define whether price whether volume was relatively high or low? Well, trading bands define whether price is relatively high or low. This definition is relative to the current price structure. So, by definition, if price is at the upper band, price is high. If price is at the lower band, price is low. That's true whether it occurs at the top portion of the chart or the bottom portion of the chart. And the reason for this is 
is that we are doing this in order to compare price action to the action of indicators. So later on we'll look at indicators and we'll find out whether indicators are high or low and then we'll know whether price is high or low and we'll combine those rules into trading systems. So the entire reason for using trading bands is to get a handle on this definition. On this definition. Trading bands define whether price is high or low and that definition is relative to the current price structure. Okay, a little bit of the history of, of trading bands. Um, this is the uh, earliest form of a price envelope that I've ever seen. Um, this is the, the twin line chart. It was reproduced in the Encyclopedia of Stock Market Techniques. Um, it's a very, very old um, technique. Uh, promulgated by um, Wilfred Ledoux. This example was printed in 1960. Ledoux was a, a technician who practiced in California. Um, 1960 was already near the end of his career. He only practiced maybe for another five years or so beyond there as I understand it. Um, so these probably had their origins in the maybe 30s or so. And it's the earliest example that I've been able to find of an envelope. What we have here is what's missing here is a bar chart of the Dow Jones Industrial Average, a monthly bar chart. Technicians used to be very long term in their outlook. It's only in the past 15 years or so the technicians have focused on the short term. If you go back and read the old technical analysis literature from the 20s, 30s, all the way up into the 70s, technicians are constantly talking about daily charts, weekly charts, and monthly charts. And they're talking about the big, major psychological turning points in the market. It's and, and this is a classic example of that. Um, Wilfred Ledoux drew a line connecting the highs of the monthly bars of the Dow Jones Industrial Average and the lows of the monthly bars of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And he said his decision rule was when the line connecting the highs crosses the line connecting the lows, you have a sell signal. Likewise, you have a buy signal when the line connecting the lows crosses the line connecting the highs. So this is the very earliest example I've been able to uncover of a envelope system deployed that was coupled with a set of rigorous rules. I have seen some older charts from the very early part of the century that had channels and envelopes drawn on them, but there was no indication whatsoever as to how they were constructed, and there was certainly no indication of what the decision rules should be that were employed by the makers of those charts. The next source also comes from 1960. Um, this is uh, Mr. Keltner. Um, he a lovely book called How to Make Money in Commodities, had a number of interesting ideas. This is a breakout system. Um, essentially, he drew uh, a line above the price structure that was reflected above a moving average by a measure of the height of the bars. So he measured the height of each bar, kept an average, and then reflected that line above it. And he buys when you break out above that line, and he sells when you break out below a similar line that's reflected downward. Notice that he doesn't make the logical jump and draw a set of bands. When he's in a downtrend, he just draws the average and 
the upper band, when he's in an uptrend, he just draws the average and lower band. And again, he's looking to capture the big moves, the big impulse moves um, to, to make a, a, a great deal of money, um, not looking to scalp the markets. He's looking for the, the places where the trend clearly has changed in a dramatic and confirmed manner. And um, again, the distance um, between the average and the bars is a reflection of the average height of the bars. Here are the rules. The Keltner byline is the 10-day moving average of the typical price. I'll get there in a minute plus the 10-day moving average of the high minus the low. So the height of the bars, each day's daily range. And the Keltner sell line is a 10-day moving average of the typical price minus the 10-day moving average of the range. Keltner is visionary in one real respect. This chart sets itself. The interval is determined by market action. There's no hard and fast rule. If the market is very volatile, the interval is very wide. If the market is very tight and very constrained, then the interval is narrow. This is one of the first examples that we can find in technical literature of adaptivity, letting the market set your decision rules for you. Letting, or not the rules themselves, but the intervals, the places at which the decisions are made. And it's a, a very, very important development. Again, this is a Keltner's picture, um, and there are um, one, two, there are four trades on there. You'll notice that two are winners and two are losers. Um, so he has, he has a 50% batting average. But the size of his losers is much smaller than the size of his winners. So he wasn't trying to get the batting average up into the 80, 90 percent range. He was really focused on trying to pick out the bigger moves and get on the right side of those moves. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, typical price. Typical price can be defined in several ways. My own definition, the one I use in my work, is the high plus the low plus the close, that quantity divided by three. Let's uh, So we have typical price. The one I use most often is the high plus the low plus the close divided by 3. Another very common formulation is the open plus the high plus the low plus the close divided by 4. Especially in systems that are, especially in systems that are um, trying to get some gauge of what's happening in the market, especially when you're looking at weekly bars or longer bars, the typical price is often a much better price than the closing price. The closing price is just a point in time. And it may be an arbitrary point in time, a Friday or 10 a.m. or something like that. So in order to catch a better flavor of the price structure, we average in the the high and the low for that period so we don't lose a lot of the information. Remember, we're working with a very small data set here and we're, we're trying not to shovel too much information out the window as we go along. So the typical price is, is an excellent way to go um, in terms of capturing information that might otherwise be lost. And here's what those bars look like um, deploy. I mean, here's what Keltner looks like deployed as a set of bands. 10-day uh, moving average running through the price structure here. 
the interval above and below the moving average set by the 10-day average of the range. Note that it's relatively tight, um, say, over in here, and then much wider over in here after you've had some very large bars. Now, later, when we talk about chandeliers, the stop methodology, will improve on this idea of taking the average range. We'll move to the average true range, which takes into account the gaps. So some of these bars are relatively narrow, but they're gapped from the prior bar. So you're giving up a piece of information. Average true range will capture that piece of information, and we'll present the methodology for that um, again later in the program. Donchian channels. Um, anybody um, know who Donchian is? Um, is this a familiar name? A very well-known um, trader in Chicago. Um, he's, he's best known in the Midwest area. He didn't have a lot of influence outside of his region, although technicians uh, um, know him. He's uh, the father of this technique. And uh, have anybody ever heard of the turtle traders? Well, this is uh, um, the basic technique that the turtle traders um, employ. Um, it's, uh, um, he created channels, uh, I'm sorry, envelopes. These have no reference to a central point. Each one is the highest high of the past 10 days. So here's the highest high of the past 10 days. That stays for 10 days. On the 11th day, it starts to move down because here's the highest high, then here's the highest high, then here's the highest high, and so forth. So each point on the chart represents the highest high of the past 10 periods or the lowest low of the past 10 periods. This line actually runs right here, right on the grid, but it's, it's still there. So um, the turtle traders um, use these channels. Um, it's an integral part of their philosophy. I frankly am not all that familiar with how they trade, so I, I can't tell you the decision rules um, that they um, use. But I have heard a, a couple of them talk, and um, they give great credence to Donchian and, and this type of approach. It's obviously a very adaptable approach. You can change the length of the bars to suit you, uh, hourly bars, so on and so forth, and you can change the look-back period to suit you. Very short-term traders will, will take that 10 days and squash it down to three or four or five, something like that. Intermediate-term traders, longer-term traders who are trying to catch more bars. Now, maybe I should stop for a second. What's my definition of a short-term trader? It's a short-term trader somebody who's trying to catch just a few bars. It right? doesn't matter whether they're five-minute bars or daily bars or weekly bars. They're just trying to pick out a few bars. An intermediate-term trader is trying to pick out a bunch of bars, maybe 10 bars or 20 bars or 50 bars. And a long-term trader is trying to pick off 100 bars or more, trying to pick out the really big trends. All right? So the, again, everything we're going to talk about is relative. Short-term trader is the number of bars they're trying to pick off, not the length of time that's spent in the bars. So short-term trader will shorten these, um, shorten the period up here. Intermediate-term trader will lengthen them. Um, now here's an example of a rational set of envelopes. Um, Geraldine Weiss of Investment Quality Trends started doing this work in the 70s. Um, and it was very, very popular work. Um, when the, um, it, it's based on the dividends that the stock trades. And what she does is she takes a, 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 a sample period in the past and she <coughs> finds the lowest dividend yield that prevailed during that period and the highest dividend yield that prevailed during that period. And she uses those dividends then to project this cone-like structure out that defines, again, high and low. Why is the structure cone-like? Because corporations tended in the past to increase their dividends. 
It was considered a measure of corporate growth, how much return they could pass through to the investor. That philosophy has changed over the past 20 years, and corporations now tend to retain their earnings and try to generate growth internally. So this approach has had, had a lot of problems in the, in the past years as that philosophy has changed and has had to be retooled to fit the new environment. But this basic idea that corporations grew their dividends and therefore the, the, this percent yield line, um, in this case this was a 1% yield. So when a stock rallied and the dividend grew so that this line would rise, and when they touched, prices were overvalued here. And this is a 2% yield line down here. When prices got down to 2%, this was an important place to think about buying. So this is a rational analysis technique. Eh? This combines beautifully fundamental analysis and technical analysis. And Geraldine Weiss was indeed a, a, a pioneer in her time. Doing this in the 70s, you know, nobody was thinking about ideas like this. I mean, this was, she was out there alone, ahead of the crowd, and, and investment quality trends was a service that, uh, I shouldn't say was a service, is still a service, um, that was a very, very important service in the development of rational analysis tools. Now we're moving up a little bit more toward the current world. This is again a set of envelopes. There's no reference here to the central price structure. This is J.M. Hurst, a very important book published uh, by Prentice Hall, 1970. Um, Hurst uh, um, retired uh, some years after this, maybe four or five years after this, became a recluse, and um, just recently has reappeared on the scene um, after many years of um, essentially going off and trading his own account. Um, he was uh, found by um, Ed Dobson, who's the uh, fellow who um, publishes um, uh, Trader's Library. Um, he, uh, um, and Ed Dobson went to him because he had written a course on cycle analysis, uh, cyclic analysis that Ed wanted to um, republish. And Ed found him just about a year and a half ago and republished that, uh, that course. So all of his material is now back in print and fully accessible today after having been um, unaccessible for the better part of 20 years. Um, Hearst was very much interested in cycles and he drew these lines to define the cycle structure. The unfortunate part about these is these lines are drawn by hand. Um, and um, the projection was done by eye. In the appendix of his book, he suggested some numerical methods um, for doing this, and a lot of people have tried to apply those methods. They proved to be very troublesome. But here we have his, one of his core ideas was taking an average of the structure to get a feel for the cycles and projecting these lines by hand around the average. So he was, as far as we know, the first person to undertake that type of uh, construction methodology, even though he didn't take it to its logical conclusion. He suggested the methodology in the book, but in no place in the book do you actually get moving average and then channels projected around it. You get this idea of drawing these lines and identifying the turns and then trying to project them out. And you can see a little bit of that here where he gives an example of the projection technique, fitting this curve, extending it out in a logical manner, and then trying to fit this curve and extend it out in a logical manner so the periodicity was similar. So he would pick these key lows as the key cycle turning points, identify them as lows in the cycle, draw the intermediate term channel, and then fit the shorter term channel inside of them, and then unfortunately 
hope that we traded inside the channel. It was kind of intuitive. Now, in his, in his course, he gets much more practical. Um, in, it's called cycle tech or something along those lines. Um, and he gets much more practical. But this was incredibly important because it provided the fuel for a dozen analysts to go out and extend these ideas and make them practical. So even though this technique in and of itself doesn't appear to have a great deal of practicality, it was the foundation upon which a great deal of modern technical analysis was eventually built. One of the first developments that came from this was this idea, um, draw a moving average, then project that moving average above and below itself by some percentage. Um, in this case, I think we're using 5% um, bands here. Oh, no, no, 10% bands. Um, so the moving average, in this case, is a 20-day moving average. And we projected the bands 10% above that moving average and 10% below this moving average. And this led to one of the earliest rigorous stock market timing systems based on bands. The rules were quite simple. Draw the 20, in this case, a 21-day moving average and 4% bands. When we tag the upper band, prices are high by definition. When we tag the lower band, prices are low by definition. Right. So here are the percentage band formulas. Start with the middle band. In this case, a 21-day moving average. To get the upper band, multiply the middle band by 1.05. This is, would be to, to generate 5% bands. Then, And this is key. To get the lower band, divide it by the same number. Divide it by 1.05. Do not multiply by 0.95. It doesn't work. And here's why. Again, must multiply and divide by 1 plus the percentage in order for the calculations to come out right. For 5% bands, the operator equals 1.05, which is 1 plus 5 one hundredths, or 5%. The correct way to do it is 100 times 1.1. In this case, these would be 10% bands, gives us 110. Then to go back, we have 110 divided by 1.1 gives us 100. That's the correct method. Rise, come back by the same thing, and come back to the starting point. Incorrect is 100 times 1.10, you get 110. But then 110 times 0.9 brings you to 99, a point below where you started. So if you're going to work with percentage bands, again, 1 plus the percentage, multiply for the upper band, divide for the lower band. Don't do the 110% and 90% work. You'll, your work will skew over time and it won't track the way that you think it should. Different, different average, different width for every stock. To make matters worse, once you've identified the correct percentages for a stock, it'll change over time. What the correct percentages are today will be different 50 periods from now or 100 periods from now. So you have to refit. So essentially, every time you look at a chart, you have to play the game of what what percent bands should I use? There has to be a better way. The solution, let's find an adaptive approach. Let's go back to the way that Keltner did things. He showed the way. He said, be adaptive. Use the range or use some measure from the price structure to have the price structure to determine this for you. Mark Chaikin made the next big step here. He said, right. 
let's get the bands to contain a certain percentage of the price action. So he created Bomar bands. And you can see here um, that they change width as time goes along. That's not an illusion caused by the fall in price. The bands are actually tightening in percentage terms across this chart because his rule is that the bands shall contain 85% of the price action of the past year. So in this case, the upper band at the right-hand side of the chart over here, the upper band was 15% above the average and the lower band was 23% beneath the average. So note that the bands aren't symmetrical. The upper bands spread not as high above and the lower bands spread at a greater interval beneath. And that's because during this period we have spent most of the time beneath the moving average. So we need a wider interval under the average to capture the price action. I don't think Bomar bands really answered the question but they had a really important idea it's like each of these peoples that came forward, they contributed another great piece of the puzzle. And that his idea was containment. Let's set the band so they contain a certain percentage of the action. And here's the formulas for Bomar bands. The upper band contains 85% of the data above the average for the past 250 periods. Those of you who took calculus will recognize that this is a simple integral. It's hard to calculate, it's intensive for a computer to calculate, but you don't have to do it. The math is out there to do this. Um, the middle band, he used a 21-day moving average. The lower band contains 85% of the data beneath the average, again, for the same look-back period. And I think the, the real problem with Bomar bands is the look-back period is so long a year. Stock prices are more adaptive than that, um, and we need a, a shorter look-back period. Okay, One final type of bands pulls in a completely external variable. Jim Yates created something called the implied risk indicator. And what he did is he said, let's set the bands by volatility but not a volatility measure the way we might use it. He was in the options market. And so he was concerned with implied volatility. So what he did is take an average and compute intervals above and below the average based on the implied volatility of the options. So when we're down here, at zone, the, the, the interval between zone 1 and zone 2, we're two implied volatilities beneath the average. And when we're up here at the interval between zone 5 and 6, we're two implied volatilities above the average. Well, you know, this was groundbreaking work. And Jim Yates, you know, justifiably won a tremendous amount of fame in the options world for this work. But he didn't take it to its logical conclusion. It's like he opened the door, looked in and said, oh yeah, it's great in there. And he reached in and took one tool out of the room, <laughs> and closed the door and said, this is my tool. And he went on and built an entire career, a very successful options analytics career based on these tools. Implied volatility, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is the volatility estimate that is embedded in the price of an option. If you buy a call option, say a $20 call three months to go, and it costs you a dollar and a half, the way that dollar and a half price was determined is somebody estimated the future volatility of that stock, what they guessed it, what the volatility was going to be, and they took that number, that implied volatility number, and dropped it into an options modeling program called the Black-Scholes model. And the Black-Scholes model took that volatility and turned it into a price. So that's what he worked with. 
there's a lot of attention given these days to the VIX, a measure of volatility based on the OEX or the option 100. All the VIX is is the average volatility of the OEX options, the average implied volatility of the OEX options. Now, implied is the key word, and it's a psychological measure. It's not a factual measure. It's what the market makers look, expect for future volatility. It's not based on, an, on, a, on past volatility. It's not based on a measure of what's happened. It's what they expect to happen in the future. So after a big decline, they expect more big volatility. And after a big advance, they often will expect more big volatility. So it's, it's really a psychological measure. And we found that the VIX, when it gets to extremely high values, and it's on its way there right now, when it gets to extremely high vo values, it means that we're at a psychological extreme and the market is very close to a turning point. Likewise, when it gets to very, very low values, we're at a different type of psychological extreme and we can, should expect a big move in the market because option makers are betting on they're gonna, that there's going to be no move or very little move in the market. So it's a contrarian tool. We want to go in the opposite direction of implied volatility. And those are the two measures that we have commonly available today. The VIX, based on the S&P 100, a measure of large cap listed, primarily listed stocks, your GEs and your mobiles and what have you. And the VXN, based on the NASDAQ 100, um, based on the 100 largest NASDAQ stocks. So those are two very interesting market timing tools. I came along and said, wait a minute. Let us use the actual volatility to determine the bandwidth. And when I, when I did that, it was an interesting time because no one calculated volatility in a moving manner. It was always done this way. You go back over the past year and calculate the volatility, often taking the difference between the high and low and dividing by two. And that volatility estimate was then used for the next year. Right? It was a static quantity. And why? Because they were hard to compute. We didn't have computers yet. Right? When I started in this business, we didn't have PCs yet. Right? I started using uh, what was called an S100 um, computer. It was a microcomputer. And um, we used an operating system called CPM. And in fact, the, the programming language I used was uh, Microsoft Basic. It was Bill Gates' very first product was a, a basic interpreter for the, and this tool allowed me to calculate volatility in a moving manner. Every day, I could have the computer recalculate the volatility for me. And that's what led to the development of Bollinger Bands. Right? It was this ability to calculate these numbers that had always been calculated in a static manner before in a dynamic manner that allowed us to use volatility to set the interval. So Bollinger Bands are that same average, 20-day moving average in this case, and they're set above and below that average by a measure of volatility. And both the volatility and the average are recalculated every day. Right. It would be another couple of years before we got PCs, but we already had spreadsheets, and that was the key. On the Apple II, you had VisiCalc, and on CPM, you had a spreadsheet called SuperCalc. And so you could just, you could enter your prices in the spreadsheet, and then in the next column, you could compute the average, and then you could compute the volatility Again, in a moving manner, a new volatility estimate, not estimate, a new volatility measure each day, and then 
project the prices out in the next couple of columns. Then in the next column you could compute an indicator and then when you got a confluence of circumstances decided by your decision rules you could make a trade. And this was a dramatic improvement in the way we did things. And frankly, I don't think we've made all that much progress since. The software has gotten incredibly flashy and it does all kinds of things. But the basic tools, the basic ideas, the basic way that we conduct our analysis was set there in 78, 79, 80, 81, 82, right in that period, the way technical analysis is conducted today was essentially set. And it was out of that environment that Bollinger Bands came and the ability to calculate all these measures on the fly that allowed technical analysis as we know it today to flower. So here's the the idea behind Bollinger Bands, a middle band, a measure of central tendency. The upper band is the middle band plus two times the standard deviation. The lower band is the middle band minus two times the standard deviation. And that's the end of our morning session.